Well, it's great to be here again. We're going to continue our study in 1 John. We're in chapter 2. Um, but before we get there, I want to go back and, and just kind of summarize some things that I think are very, very important. But let me say this before we start. Have you ever heard the word context? Context. Uh, let, let me give you an example. If you see a person and all you see in the photo is the person, you see no backdrop, you see nothing in front of them, you just see them looking with a terrified look on their face. Okay, that's all. Or it, let's say an excitable look on their face. You don't know what's happening. You, you cannot know what is happening. Did they? Is it Christmas and they're excited? Is it? Did they see a, a Sasquatch? Uh, uh, you know, what happened? Did they just get their semester final grades? You, you don't know what really happened to them. Why? Because you can't see the context. You don't know what's behind them, beside them, before them. Okay? So you can misinterpret, easily misinterpret, whatever you're seeing. It's the same way in Scripture. And it's one of the, way that, one of the ways that cults begin. You just take a Scripture out of its context and you can make it say almost anything. Do you see? You can take a politician's words out of context. You can take a teacher's words out of context. And you can go on social media and try to destroy them. And do it successfully. Why? Because even though we're highly advanced in one sense in technology, we, we've lost our ability to reason. Or, or to think. We seem to be moved by passions and emotions and angers. Okay? And we need to realize that. And I think that social media, although it it's, can be a blessing, I think it's heightened that. You see, you, you just I, I hear arguments every day. I remember when I was, you know, several years ago when I was teaching my little boys logic, classical logic. And then we would go in and, and someone would say something on the television. And, you know, my nine-year-old would say, Dad, that's a logical fallacy. Or he's practicing ad hominem here. He's not, that's not a right. But we're not a society who knows how to do that anymore. And when we come to the Bible, you know, I could pull a verse out and make you think it's saying actually what it's not saying. Or maybe it is saying that, but you have to balance it with another truth. And, and that's why 1 John is so important. And I, before we get to chapter 2, I want to I just show you something. First of all, throughout this whole book, he's going to tell you that if you do certain things and you don't do certain things, you're not a Christian. Now, that would make you think that you become a Christian and you maintain your Christianity by doing certain things and not doing certain things. But we just heard that's not true Christianity, and it's not. So when we hear John say basically, if you're not loving your brother, you don't know God, it's not that you come to know God by loving your brother. So we have to look at the context. And this is the context. If you look at chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, it begins with this. It begins with a person. It begins with the person of Jesus Christ. That that's where you have to have the center in your Christianity or it'll turn into legalism and moralism and ethics. You see, we are Christians because we trust in the saving work of God through His Son, Jesus Christ. That's what makes us Christians. Now, what John is going to argue throughout this entire book is that once you become a Christian, and that means by faith in Jesus Christ, only faith, it's only grace, it's God's unmerited favor, unearned favor. You become a Christian when you trust in what God has done for you through Christ. But when you become a Christian, and we'll probably get into this later, God does a work in your heart, and not just in some people's hearts who become Christians. He does a work in the heart of every child of God. Now, although it is true, some Christians may grow faster than others. And all of us, you know, sometimes it's three steps forward, two steps back. It is true. We grow in different ways and in different areas. Yet at the same time, if you are a Christian, your life will begin to change. 
it will begin to conform to the image of Christ. Okay? Now, so Christianity in 1 through 4 is about a person. And if all your Christianity is, and I remember talking to students last year at Virginia Tech, and so many of them, when I'd say, are you a Christian? Yes. Well, what do you mean by that? I go to church. I'm a good person. I, I try to do good. That means nothing in biblical Christianity. That doesn't make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is coming to believe, trust, rely upon, not what you can do to earn God's favor, but what God has done for you to save. Okay? Now, once we get through that, in verses 1 through 4, in 5 through 10, he begins to tell us something. That a person who truly believes God has worked in their hearts so that they are changed and they begin to change. Now, what do I mean by that? There is an ontological change when you believe in Christ. Paul says, if anyone be in Christ, you're a new creature. Something really happens. But then there's this progress of it working itself out. And, and I've been a Christian for 35 years. It's still working itself out. I still have to say, you know, to like a, I still have to say to my daughter, forgive me, I was impatient with you. I have to say to my wife, you know, that was a thoughtless remark. So it's still working its way out. I, I have been changed. I am changing and hopefully will change. Okay? But that's as a result of what Christ has done. Now, in the next verses, what John says is this. If you are a Christian, there will be evidences. Now, he didn't make that up. Remember what Jesus said? You will know them by their profession. No. He said you will know them by their fruits. Now, let me give you a, a lesson in ontology. Ontology has to do with ontos, being, uh, nature. Okay? So, how many of you, if I brought in a piece of bark from a tree, could tell me what tree it is? Not many of you, probably. Maybe you could, all right? All right. Let's say that I brought in the, the bark from an apple tree or a leaf from an apple tree. Most of you would not be able to identify that tree. But if I brought in a limb with apples on it, at least some of you would figure out <laughs> that it's an apple tree, okay? And that's what Jesus is saying. So by the fruit of that tree, you know the ontology of that tree. By the fruit of that tree, you know the nature of it. It is an apple tree. Now, it doesn't, it's not an apple tree because it produces apples, right? It produces apples because it is an apple tree. The nature is what governs. So, what John is going to tell us is this that if we truly have become a Christian, one of the fruits or manifestations of that is that we will walk in the light. And that has a reference primarily to what God has revealed to us about Himself and His will through the person of Jesus Christ. A true Christian, one of the characteristics is they are going to begin, and it's a progress, okay? It's a process. They are going to begin to walk in a way that is conformed to what God has told us about Himself and His will. Okay? And like I said, sometimes it's going to be two steps forward, three steps back, three steps forward, one step back. You're going to look like you're growing and then you're going to look like you're not. Okay? But it's, but oh, let, let me give you an example. If you were to drive to Floyd, okay, here we are and let's say Floyd's here. Driving to Floyd, would it look like this? No. Driving to Floyd, it would look like this. So it, even though you're going up as a whole, there are times I'm going to look at you and go, man, you're really going up. And then I'm going to look at you and go, man, you're really going down. Well, you're going up again. Well, you're going down. But over that long process, what happens? If we were to pull it tight and make it straight, you're going up. That's one of the evidences of the Christian life. And John's written this whole book with regard to evidence. How do you know that you're a Christian? And that's very important because we live in an evangelical world, a Christian world in America, that in the last 75 to 100 years has drastically changed. And it basically goes like this. So many young people who are raised in church, 
you know, when they're nine years old or something, someone will come to them and go, do you want to be saved? Well, yeah. Well, then believe in Jesus. Do you believe in Jesus? Yes, I believe in Jesus. A little kid. Do you love Jesus? Yeah, I love Jesus. Okay, let's baptize him. That is so wrong. It's so wrong. Superficial, maybe even manipulative. It's wrong. That's why, for example, you know, when I'm teaching at a seminary or whatever and dealing with, with, with students or I'm teaching a pastor's conference or, or in our own church, for example, when my, when my son came to me at 13 and said, Dad, I think God has, I, I think God saved me last night. I said, why, Evan? He said, well, I spent the whole night, I was up the whole night. It was just like the presence of Christ was so real. Okay. Well, Dad, what should I do? Well, go talk to the elders. By myself? Yes. And he sat down and he talked to them and then he talked to me some more. And I said, son, tell you what, let's just keep reading the scriptures. I appreciate and affirm whatever God's done in your life, but keep, let's just keep reading the scriptures. About a year and a half later, he came to me, he comes up the stairs of the basement, I'll never forget it. And he goes like this, Dad, I wasn't a Christian last year. I said, really? I said, so tell me about it. He said, I'm a Christian now. I said, how do you know? Well, I've been reading again through the Gospel of John. And this is what I see clearly from the Scriptures. You're not a Christian because you feel like you sensed some sort of presence. You're a Christian because you find yourself believing in Jesus Christ, and He is your only hope. And Dad, I can tell you, I am utterly convinced He's my only hope. Now see, if He'd have been in most churches, what would have happened? They'd have dunked Him so quick. You say, that's not right. People aren't numbers. You don't count them. They're people, and they're made in the image of God, and you deal with them very, very carefully. They are convinced. You don't convince them. You tell them the truth. God convinces, not us. Now, I said all that to say this. John wrote this book so that we would have certain evidences where we could compare our life to these evidences and then ask ourselves biblically, do I look like this at all? And the first test he gives is, as we went over last week, it's walking in the light. That... When, when you look at, at your life, you're sincerely wanting to know who God is. You're sincerely wanting to know His will. And you're seeking to walk in His will. Not perfectly. Struggling sometimes. Sometimes very apathetic. I still have to deal with apathy. But when you deal with apathy, you know it's wrong. But now he goes on in verse 8 and he goes to another test. If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. And then he goes on in 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins. Then he goes back in verse 10. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And this is one of the most amazing things. After telling us that one of the evidences is that we are going to begin to walk in the light, that we're going to live a different way, he immediately comes back and says... One of the other great evidences of Christianity is that the Christian recognizes sin in their life. Okay? So, man, he's really, he's really, I mean, the Holy Spirit is really wise here. Because he's saying, yeah, there are going to be evidences. But then he's backing up and going, but that doesn't mean perfection. There's going to be a style of life. But then again, we don't want you going to another extreme and looking in the mirror and seeing faults and saying, I can't be a Christian because I still sin. A Christian sins, but they have a new relationship with sin. When I was in college, before I was converted, me and sin like walked arm in arm the same way and were good friends. After I became a Christian, something changed. Sometimes it seemed like we were locked arm in arm, but sin was going that way. And I was going this way. And sometimes I went forward and sometimes it dragged me back. But what you can see is there is a dramatic difference, right? Between me and sin now. When people come to me sometimes and flippantly say, I got a new relationship with God. I always ask them, do you have a new relationship with sin? 
Because if you don't have a new relationship with sin, you don't have a new relationship with God. It's very important to understand, right? Okay, now he's going to go on because all of this, whether you know it or not, has presented us with a terrible theological, philosophical problem. Matter of fact, it's what the whole Bible's written about. And that is, hold it. How can a just God forgive sin? Now, I know some of you think, how can that be a problem? It's a great problem. It's the greatest problem in the Bible. If God is just, He can't turn away from your sin. He can't just pretend you didn't do it. Your sin was an offense to His holiness. It was a violation of His law, His will. It was a sin against others. It was a sin against creation. It was a sin against all this. And for God to just to forgive is a denial of His justice. And see, here's something you need to understand. I know churches don't teach on the attributes anymore of God, but they should. You've got to know who He is, the full picture. He really is righteous. He really is just. He really is loving. He really is merciful. And that presents a problem when dealing with a sinner because justice demands that the sinner satisfy the demands of that justice. And if they break that justice, they must pay. Love seeks for the sinner's forgiveness. But in the person of God, there can be no contradictions. That's why other, some theologians, especially in the 16th century, would write about the harmony of the attributes of God. How can God's attributes be at peace with one another? How can justice make friendship with mercy? Justice says this person has sinned. The wages of sin is death. Mercy says we must find a way. Justice says, if we find a way, it will not be by me diminishing my demands at any point. You see? Now, so now John's going to address this in verse 1. My little children, this is a term of affection. And, and let, me, let me share with you something. I have had the privilege of running with some of the greatest theologians in the world working with them, friends of mine, brilliant men, scholars and languages and everything else. Guess what? The most mature and the most scholarly, the most biblical of them, this title still fits, a child. A child. You know, it's like, I don't know, you're doing quantum mechanics on the blackboard and your dog's looking at it like that. And it seems so cute that he thinks he understands. I mean, we can know God and we can understand great things about Him, but we will always be on this side of heaven, little children. As a matter of fact, the more you grow in your knowledge of God, the more it humbles you to realize, man, I have one title, saved. <laughs> Passive voice, God has saved me. That's it. One claim to fame, saved not academics, not knowledge even of the languages, or I'm saved. Okay? Now, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Now see what's happening? John's readers are a lot like us. John goes, okay, if you're really a Christian, you're, you're still going to sin at times, and you're going to struggle with it, and, uh, and that's one of the evidences of a Christian. So they're all going, oh, well, great. <laughs> I can sin. It's no big problem because that's what Christians do. And then John comes back again with wisdom and says, no, no, hold it. I'm writing these things to you not to give you a license for sin, but so that you do not sin. You see that? It's just like Paul's problem when he gets through with Romans chapter 5. In Romans chapter 5, he's talked about, well, in 4 also, grace, 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 grace. And so in 6, his enemies come back and say, oh, what Paul is saying is this, since it's all of grace, let us just sin so that we'll need more grace and God will get more glory. And Paul has to go back and say, that's not at all what I'm saying. As a matter of fact, he says, megunathai in Greek, which is really strong language. May it never be is not strong enough. That's not what I'm saying. Okay, so John is doing something kind of the same way. 
He's saying, now I've told you this, that sin will still be a reality in the life of the believer, even though they will be adverse to it and they'll confess it. And they'll get victory over it little by little. But he said, I'm writing these things to you not to give you a license to sin. He says, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Now, what would keep us from sinning? Well, there's a lot of motives. I mean, sin can really mess up your life. Um, but there's a really bigger reason. It's love. Why do we not want to sin? Because of love. Now, you see, he says, these things, uh, I write to you these things so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, if a certain one sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now, why do I not want to sin? Christ died for my sin. That's why I don't want to sin. Why do I not want to sin? Because the Father and the Son dwell with me in the person of the Holy Spirit. And I can grieve the Holy Spirit by my sin. Remember I shared with you, I think, last week, one of the worst things when you first get married. And you, you have to you just... When is it going to happen? Because it's going to happen. When you say something... You know, you're married now and you say something to your wife that hurts her for the first time, and you look at her face, she's, she's, she's grieved. It's like something, like a fist to the chest. Something cracked a little. And you sit there hopefully and you go, you know, I used to tell young guys, after you get married, you need to get an oak. It has to be oak two before, about four feet long. So that when you do things like that, you go out the back of the house and you hit yourself in the head repeatedly with that board. And that will feel a lot better, actually, than what should be going on in your heart. Okay? When we love someone, we really love someone. We just don't want to be contrary to their right desires. We don't want to break their heart. And the better they are to us, the more kind they are to us, what does that do? It draws out our affections and makes us want to please them more. So why do we not want to sin? The great cost that Christ had to pay and the fact, and we're going to see this in a minute, we'll go back and dissect this a little more. Also, it's the fact that after dying for us and knowing that we still sin, He's an advocate for us. He's on our side. He's the paraclete, the one called alongside for defense, for aid, for help. I will not forsake you. I will not abandon you. I will not leave you. I mean, there's some strength in that. I mean, th that motivates, doesn't it? To say, no, I want to be, I I want to be better for Him and for what He's done. Okay? Now, so he says, my children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, a lot of people will take this and do something like this. Let me give you an illustration. It's very popular and terribly wrong. Okay. That they have this idea that the Father in heaven is, is angry and wants to snuff you out. I mean, even after you become a Christian. I mean, He's all about judgment, judgment, judgment. And Jesus comes along and He loves you. And he dies for you. He satisfies this angry God. And then this God that's so ready to get angry all the time Jesus Christ is kind of standing between both of you and saying, no, 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 don't, don't, don't. I know they sin. I know they sinned, but, but don't. That's, that's not what's going on here. I want you to remember something. Remember John 3.16? For God 
so loved the world that He initiated, He sent His only begotten Son. Do you see that? Now, when we go back to the Old Testament, let's look at this. We see all these pictures of God, and He can be pretty terrifying. Guess what? Here's something that you need to understand. The person of the Son, the second person of the Trinity, has always been the mediator between God and man. God created the world through His Son. Created the world for His Son. Created the world through His Son. Reveals Himself to the world through His Son. Sustains the world through His Son. Redeems the world through His Son. Will judge the world through His Son. You need to understand, the Father and the Son are in perfect agreement. One day Christ will return and will judge the earth. And He will return as a warrior taking vengeance, very clear in the Scriptures. So don't think there's this somehow this struggle within the three persons of the Trinity. You've got the Son and the Spirit really loving you and caring for you and trying to protect you from, from God the Father. That's not the way it is. But what I want you to see is this. And, and all this language is going to be limited, okay? It's going to be limited, like... You try to talk about string theory or something in physics. I don't care who you are. Your language is limited. You talk about four dimensions. You know, your language is limited. Like trying to explain three dimensions to a, you know, a cartoon that is two-dimensional. So our language is limited. But here, here's what I want you to see. God, the triune God. There's a thing that we call the eternal counsel. And there's evidences of it in, in different passages in the Bible that, that Christ, you know, uh, crucified. And talking about before the foundation of the world, certain decrees were made, certain, certain things, and that were manifested now in our time. God is just. God created man with the foreknowledge of the fall, which means more than he just saw it. Foreknowledge also means he was involved without being complicit, without being guilty. But it, it's so complex and so beyond us that we've got to kind of hold on to attention. When man fell, was it man's full responsibility? Absolutely. Did God foreknow it? Absolutely. Does foreknowledge mean more than just he saw it in a crystal ball? Absolutely. And we just have to hold on to these things as a mystery. But the point I want you to get, he foreknew the fall, but he also foreknew the work of redemption. Do you see that? Before the foundation of the world. And here's the thing. In the fall, God cannot simply pardon. Something must be done. Justice must be satisfied. And that's what happened on the cross. That's why he's referring now to Christ. In the next verse, he's going to talk about Christ as our propitiation. The idea is this. Before the foundations of the world were laid, God foreknew the, the fall of man, but He also foreknew the way that a guilty man could be reconciled to a holy God. And in doing so, all the attributes of God would be manifested in a way through the work of redemption that they could have never been manifested any other way. We would see God full-orbed. We would see His justice. We would see His mercy. We would see His truth. We would see His compassion and love. And it's all in the cross. So here we are, guilty. How can we be reconciled to God? Shall not the judge of all the earth do right, as it says in Genesis? Will He just turn His face away from our sin like a corrupt judge? No. He condemns us in His perfect righteousness. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit condemn us for our sin. And then God becomes a man and lives the perfect life that we could never live. Goes to the cross and dies in our stead, in our place, on our behalf, bearing our sin and suffering all the wrath of God in our place. When He said, it is finished, it meant He had fulfilled, paid all the demands of justice that were against 
you for your sin. He suffered the wrath of God you should have suffered. He paid the demands you should have paid throughout all eternity. And it's done. It's finished. Now, God can show mercy to you and still maintain His righteousness because He died under the penalties of that righteousness in your place. So God is just and the justifier of the wicked. Do you see? So when it says that Christ is an advocate, if God were to simply look at me apart from the work of Christ, there would be no hope. Not just God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. There'd be not, there's, there's no, He's good. I'm not. But through this redemptive work, through the Son, the work that the Son has done, all of this puts an end to my sin. Puts an end to the enmity between me and God. There Christ stands, having finished the work on our behalf. But not only that, and we won't have time to get into it tonight, but as an advocate, He's also constantly, and this is very difficult to understand, but it is very true, He is constantly he, with His perfect knowledge of our need, He is constantly, as the God-man now, constantly petitioning the Father for a full supply for us of grace for every need, every trial. And that's why we run to Him. Okay? Let me give an example. Yesterday, I was literally... This is going to sound so stupid, I know. But I was in tears yesterday. All right. My wife says I have an oversensitive conscience. So I was, when I had my heart attack, you know, almost two and a half years ago, and the brain trauma, everything, year and a half of trying to crawl out of a hole. My wife called me Rain Man all the time. I mean, it was very difficult. Well, my license expired. My driver's license expired, and no one ever looked. Okay? So I got pulled over one day. I wasn't speeding or anything, but they just pulled me over and they said, can your license? Oh yeah, here's my license. They said, sure, your license is expired. And I'm like, I mean, I just want to die. I feel like I've committed murder or something, you know. So I had to go to court yesterday and my wife is going, what's wrong with you? I mean, you, you, they understand. They're not going to do it. No, i I'm evil, I'm horrible, I've done this, you know, they're probably going to hang me in front of everybody. <laughs> and I, I go in there and I sit down and I'm just, I'm a criminal. <laughs> I should never minister again. And you know what was so neat? The policeman who gave me the ticket, I mean, there were a lot of people in the place and there were other policemen. He walked in the door and he went and he looked at me and I go, yep, I'm a goner. <laughs> he looked at me and he, he walked over. Everybody's looking at him like, why is the... He walked over to me. Walked, I was almost all the way in the back. He walked all the way to the back. He goes, uh, Mr. Washer, right? And I said, yes. And he goes, uh, look, Mr. Washer, this is... Don't... And I mean... I don't know why he did this. And everyone, everyone else is kind of looking at him. He goes, Mr. Washer, don't, don't worry about this. Look, this is just trivial. Um, you've, you've got the evidence that you've, you've got your license renewed, right? And this take care of you. When we go up to the judge, the judge is going to look at you. And I can't tell you what to plea, but your three options are. And he told me that. And I go up there and the uh, judge said, smiles at me. He says, so, Mr. Washer, your license expired. I understand there were some... Things happened. I said, yes. And she goes, oh, she goes, uh, okay. Well, can you show the policeman that you got your license? I said, yeah. And they go like that. She goes, okay, great. Uh, fine. Just uh, pay your court costs and have a good day. But, but here's my point. It's like the Lord, you know, knew that I'm in those types of things. I'm so fragile. He sent the policeman there just to say, hey, Mr. Washer, when you go up there, this is what's going to happen. Don't worry about it. Now, why would he even know that? Now, I know that's a silly thing, but I want to tell you something. There's been big deliverances in my life, like when I've been in the middle of a war, this is happening. But, but the things that have been most precious to me is when it seemed like 
Well, it was. Christ could look. He didn't even have to look. He has knowledge even before it happens, exhaustively, immediate, without need of investigation. He could look and see, yeah, he's weak as a worm, but he's my worm and I love him. So I'm going to send that policeman over there just to tell him, don't have a heart attack again because <laughs> you, you did. You see, I, I mean, I, I walked out of there just knowing it. I remember one time when we were missionaries on the field. Now, th this is not getting away from it. We've talked about the big thing of redemption. But now let me show you how this advocacy thing, it's not just he stands there and, and he's your salvation. It's not just that he stands there and prays for these monumental things. Chato and I, my wife Chato, we were missionaries for years in Peru. And, uh, and we, we came back to the States for about a three-month break. I'll never forget this. And she, she never asked me for anything. I mean, never. And uh, she said, uh, it was years ago when these country crafts became really popular and like she, was, she saw them in a magazine, I don't know how, in Peru. And she says, when we go back, she goes, could we get some country crafts to take back to our house? And uh, I mean, I was like, yeah, sure. They don't cost much, you know. So I think we were in Gatlinburg or something and we walked in the store and I saw her go around like this and she's like looking and it's like, man, those little animals cost more than real cows. I mean, it was like real expensive. And I saw her. She didn't say anything. She just looked at all the crafts and she said, well, let's go. She walked out. A week later, we're in West Tennessee and we, I had to preach, share about the mission. And the preacher said, you'll stay at my home. And the, we get to the home and the, the wife said, you know, I've just remodeled my whole home. You're going to be staying in this guest room. We walked in and there was a box about that big. And she said, I've remodeled my whole house and I've, I got some stuff there I'm just going to throw away or give to Goodwill if, if you want any of it. You can have it. And my wife sat there on the bed, oh, thank you very, very much. When she left the room, she jumped on that box like a, like a rat on a Cheeto. <laughs> and, uh, and, and she opened it up, and you know what? Now remember, I'm an old crouchy reform guy. But opened it up, and it was full of country crafts. So, yes, he stands there. He is our Savior. His perfect work, it's finished. God can only look at you with love. God the Father only can see you with love. All wrath has been extinguished. All sin has been done away with. You, as a matter of fact, you will not have a better position in heaven than you have right now. You're as righteous before God. Your position is as righteous now as it will be then. Now, you'll be changed then, but as far as God dealing with you, okay? But that advocacy doesn't just mean all these big, important, beautiful things. It also means when you're scared for no reason at all, and sometimes God will just send someone to encourage you. Are there something like you just want something for your house? Do you see what I'm saying? I want you to see it's not just in these big things. It's the full course of your life that you have this kind advocate who is petitioning the Father who has decreed. He delights, the Father delights in blessing His children. Because this problem with sin has been done away with by the Son. Okay, and next week what we're going to talk about is it mentions propitiation here. It's a very big word, uh, a word that has been battled over, even in some translations of the Bible. But it may be outside of the names of God, it may be the most important word in the entire Bible because it deals with this problem that we've been talking about. How can a just God forgive sin and still be just? It's propitiation. Now, let me, I just need to say this so that you understand it. The doctrine of justification, okay? Now, I know it sounds like a big word. This is the basis of everything I've been talking about. 
Justification. Have you ever heard in the Bible it says we have been justified? Okay. All right. Justified is a forensic term. It's a legal term. Okay. The moment you believe in Christ, God legally, based upon what Christ did for you, the death He died for you, the life He lived for you, the moment you believe in Christ, God legally declares you righteous before Him. And that's not a some kind of or a little bit of righteousness or a 99% righteousness. It's perfect righteousness. Okay? But here's, the, and some of you know that, okay? The moment you believe in Jesus, God declares you righteous. But here's something that's often left off the doctrine of justification. The moment you believe in Christ, God declares you to be righteous and treats you as righteous. Now, how many times did Adam and Eve sin before they were no longer treated as righteous? Once. He treats you as righteous because all your sins were paid for on the cross. So not only does He declare you, you are right with me, He treats you as right with Him. So that even when you sin and He disciplines you, it's not discipline of wrath, it's discipline of a loving father correcting a child for their own good. And His love is not diminished. As a matter of fact, discipline is a manifestation of His love. Do you see? And that's what I want you to see. Now, I want you to see two things and then we'll finish. He who knew no sin was made sin on our behalf on that cross. Jesus was made sin. He became the curse. Now, what does that mean? We'll talk about this a few weeks from now maybe, but this is important that you understand this. When, when we say that Jesus was, our 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says that He was made sin, what does that mean? Does that mean on the cross Christ became corrupted? Defiled in His nature? What does it mean? No, because even on the cross He was the spotless Lamb of God. This is a legal thing. And it's beautiful. On the cross, the perfect lamb without sin was legally declared guilty. Your sin was imputed to him and he was legally declared guilty. Okay? Legally. Did he become guilty? I mean, I mean, did he become corrupt? Absolutely not. He was the sinless, spotless lamb. But on that cross, your sin was imputed to him and he was legally declared guilty and he was treated as guilty. That means all the wrath of God fell down upon him as the guilty one. And the moment you believe in Jesus, you are legally declared right with God and you're treated as one who is perfectly right with God. And his love is poured out upon you. But see, it's all dependent not on your performance, is it? It's dependent on Christ's performance. You remember Joseph had the coat of many colors and he wouldn't share it with his brothers and they all got mad. Well, Christ is greater than Joseph. He lived a perfect life. He died a perfect death. And he did that in your stead, in your place. So that the moment you believe in him, all your sins are paid for, past, present, and future, by virtue of His death on Calvary. But then, He takes His life of perfect righteousness, okay? Let's say His coat, the greater than Joseph. His coat of perfect righteousness, and what does He do? He clothes you in it. Now you're completely forgiven before God for sins past, present, and future, and you are, it is placed in your account the righteousness of Christ, the perfect life that He lived is now yours. And so you are completely and perfectly reconciled to God and nothing can change that. Do you see why, you see why it is so wrong if you say, well, I'm a Christian because I go to church and I try to do good. Compared to... Can you see how ridiculous that is? No, I'm a Christian because... I trust in this magnificent work of God on my behalf. We are saved by grace? Yes. By believing? Yes. So you just live like the devil now? No, I don't want to. Why? I've seen this. I've seen it. I see, I see what he did. 
It has transformed me, this gospel. Do you see? So it's all about Him. There is an ethic. There is a morality to Christianity. But that is something that comes as a result of something infinitely greater. It's the gospel, the good news. Okay? That Jesus Christ died for the likes of me. I say this. Let's say you became a Christian. I've, I've been a Christian, a missionary, a preacher, a teacher, a student for longer than you guys have been alive. I've suffered a lot of things in a lot of places around the world. Let's say you just became a Christian a half hour ago and have really, really done almost nothing. And if we both die at this moment, we go to heaven for the exact same reason. And I don't add anything to my salvation. You went, isn't it? That's amazing, isn't it? That, that's amazing. That's wonderful. Now, the proud will say, I don't like that. I mean, I did a lot of stuff. I, but the humble, they hear it and they rejoice. Do you see that? That's amazing to me that the brand new believer has the same position, the same righteousness, the same status before God as, you know, a, a William Carey who gave his life for India or an Amy Carmichael who did the same. I love that. All of grace. All right? Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for Your kindness. Thank You for Your mercy. Most of all, thank You for Your Son. And I pray that you have blessed these students, Lord, with the knowledge of your Son. In Jesus' name, amen.